It's a pleasure to reintroduce Temple Grandin, who is going to talk about how to keep livestock calm during handling. Well, now I talk about something I really like to talk about. And I want to thank everybody for sticking around to the end of the afternoon. I'm going to try to wake you up. Okay. One of the things you need to do if you're working with cattle and horses, other large animals, understand how they see. They have wide angle vision. And a lot of people, when they first start working with them, don't realize that. But you do have a little blind spot right behind the butt. And that's where you don't want to be walking up to them. And the problem we got today is you got a lot of students coming in now, a lot of people coming into working with animals that have had absolutely no experience at all. In fact, uh, I, had, I did a book signing at a Costco where you stay in the store for six hours. It's going to get pretty boring. So I decided to become a Costco sales associate, and I just started approaching people to sell books. <laughs> and uh, I found kind of a shocking thing. This was just two years ago. In South Denver, 20% of the families had no animal at all. No gerbil, no parakeet, nothing. In other words, they've totally gotten separated from animals. I think that's very sad. A basic principle in handling animals is calm animals are easier to handle. If an animal gets all upset, it takes 20 or 30 minutes for it to calm back down. It doesn't matter whether it's a dog or a cat, horse, cow. They're calm, they're easier to handle. Okay, what are some signs that cattle are really calm? So they got nice, soft brown eyes. Horses have the same thing. There's been a number of research studies that show that when you see the whites of the eye, the animal is getting scared. In fact, Tina Wadowski's group, she's gone away, had to go back up to Canada, did some research on this. And uh, researchers have found that if you give them Valium, then you don't see the whites of the eyes. So that shows that it really is fear. Cattle chewing their cud, you know, the ears are forward, you know, their heads down, grazing, those are calm cattle. There's a nice calm horse with the ears forward. You know, a lot of people don't look at body posture things. And I'm finding in my classes now, a lot of people want to try to teach people more to look at the animal. Look at detail. That good herdsman that I talked about this morning, he looks at detail. You know, what's the posture look like? I mean, if the dog is uh, got his butt up in the air and his front feet down, well, then he's happy. You know, obviously if he's growling, he's not very happy. Okay, here are some signs of fear and anxiety in horses, cat. The tail is swishing. That doesn't mean happy in horses and cat. Dogs, no butts wiggling, that's happy. And as they get more and more scared, the tail goes faster. Then they kick you, or they buck you off. But they'll give you that early warning. Heads up, looking all around. Horses will start sweating. Animals defecate more when they get scared. Whites of the eyes show, and the ears pin back. You need to watch for those things. Now, I'm sure all the experienced people already know that, but there's a lot of people coming in that don't know these things. Well, are these calm? You know, they're pretty calm. The one in the back, that's probably the one with the more flighty temperament. He's out looking up. There's more vigilant. There's a steer flipping his tail. Now, he's not going to go very far in the squeeze chute, but often they'll do that, and then they'll start violently struggling. I want people to see this. You see horses that are switching their tail, then he bucks the person off. You know, I want you to look for that early warning. There's the whites of the eyes showing, and I don't like nose tongs. You got to hold the head. Let's use a halter to hold the head. Nose tongs hurt. Then the next time you got to restrain the head, they're all there blowing snot all around all over the place because they don't forget. And one of the earlier speakers talked about the importance of first experiences need to be good first experiences. Whether it's the first experience going through the cattle handling facilities, first experience of a heifer going through the milking parlor, it'd be a really good idea to train her to go through the parlor before she freshens. And make sure that first experience is good. No falling on the butt, nothing bad happening. Well, there's a frightened horse right there. Ears pinned back, uh, he's either frightened or aggressive. You know, people that have grew up with animals knew these things. 
But I'm finding now, after 35 years of being in this field, that these very, very basic things, you know, we've got to teach people. Look at which way the ears are pointing. See how the zebra and the horse have an ear on each other? And then the other ear's on me. What are they looking at? They'll watch with their ears. I call it ear radar. They'll show you if you just observe. Then you've got to get all the distractions that scare animals out of the cattle handling facilities. You know, there's a chain hanging down. There's a reflection. They see people walking by. You know, the very first work I ever did, I got down in the chutes to see what the animals were seeing. And people thought that was really crazy, but it seemed like a sensible thing to me. <laughs> and if you understand these behavioral indicators, they'll give you a warning, too, before an animal gets upset. And you need to try to prevent situations that cause animals to get frightened or agitated. One thing that you need at every animal handling facility, I don't care whether it's for dogs, cats, horses, cattle, non-slip flooring. I cannot emphasize enough the importance of non-slip flooring. Animals panic when they start to slip. You know, so you put on a stainless steel table and then the slip sliding around. Maybe have the dog owner bring a bath mat in from home with a rubber backing to put the dog on. Make sure you've got a non-slip uh, unloading area, non-slip area for examining animals. Because in cattle, when you're trying to hold them, you get little jigs like this. So you've got the dairy cow in, you're trying to work on her, she's jumping all around, because that foot's just jigging like this, slip slide. And you look where they've pooped on the floor and you can see the skid marks. A broom finish, like we've got right here in this uh, auditorium, that does not work for, uh, you know, for livestock. You're going to have to have a better floor than that. I'm amazed at the number of places I have fixed with non-slip flooring. You know, be observant of the things that make them stop. You see how that pig's stopping at the metal strip? They'll show you the stuff they don't like. Look at the shadows you've got there. You can have time of day effects. You know, when it's cloudy, you don't have those shadows. Now, obviously, you can't get rid of every shadow, but I want to just make you aware and give that animal, that lean animal, a chance to just stop, put the head down, and take a little look. You know, you just push them up there, they're going to turn back on you. But if you let it stop and take a look, then maybe the leader will walk over the metal strip. There's a chain hanging down in the chute. I've been talking about these for a long time. And why do I still have to talk about this? because people don't take them out. You see, the normal human mind drops out the details. There's been some interesting brain scan research on this. And uh, the person with autism tends to pick up the details. Well, you've got to try to train people to look for details. Now I have checklists, you know, verbal checklists of all the things to look for. But you've got to take that chain out of there. People are still not taking them out. I always get asked, do they know they're going to get slaughtered? Well, I found that the behavior was the same at the local plant as it was going up a chute at a feed yard. Now, I show this slide to students, and I say, now, I want you to tell me about this slide, some things that might be wrong here that might need to be corrected. Well, of course, they'll try to find the one little piece of this piece of chain there against the side of the chute. That's good. One thing that's good in this picture is in the tunnel, you've got white translucent panels so it doesn't look like a black hole. But over half the students fail to see the number one problem right there that would stop the cattle from going up that chute. You got three people standing in the wrong place. You're trying to drive them into people. And one of the guys has big silver huge sunglasses. That's probably definitely guaranteed to scare them. Sometimes the most obvious is the least obvious. Here's a little hint, little thing, a handy thing that sometimes works with beef cattle that don't want to come into the squeeze chute. Put a piece of cardboard on the back half. So as you're standing there working that squeeze chute, they don't see you standing there really close in the flight zone. Get down in there and see what they're seeing. This is good. You can see a lighted place to go, but they don't see people hovering over it. But they see that there is a place to go. Now that's a very nice non-slip uh, floor mat right in front of that chute. It's made out of woven tires. But look at how that animal is looking right at that sunbeam. 
I really want to get you looking for this kind of detail, for this kind of, observe these kinds of details. The fear of falling that makes an animal panic. It's a primal fear. You know, you don't want to be out there skidding around on ice. That's one of the reasons why they get so upset when they start to fall. Think about time of day effects. The sun's coming up over the top of the milking pond or coming up over the top of a truck. It may be hard to get them in because they're blinded. You don't like it driving down the freeway. You got a bad reflection there. Maybe change the time of day you do some things if there's a problem with that. I want to get you thinking about time of day effects and how that can affect handling. And it affects handling a lot more in situations where you don't have opportunity for learning. Now, of course, the cows learn to walk over a metal strip. They may learn to walk over a reflection, but it's a new heifer that's going to have a problem with it. And you want to make sure, don't just get her upset, give her a chance to investigate it and walk over it. Rapid movement, it makes horses and cattle run away, but it makes the dog chase. Rapid movement is very, very, very stimulating to the nervous system. But in a predator, it has the opposite effect that it has in prey species animals like cattle and horses. You know, something moving about like that will scare. Now, when I was out on the movie site, they had this really cool camera. And if you're a techie, this is called a giraffe with a hot head with fluid motion control wheels. And they can float this camera just over the cattle like this. And the thing that's really interesting about this camera is the cattle don't react to it. It's amazing. They don't view it as a threat because it just floats. It moves just about like that. No jerkiness of motion. Jerkiness of motion would scare. We also have got to get people to not yell and scream at livestock. The research is very, very clear. Yelling and screaming is highly stressful. Some of the research was done by Joe Stuckey up in Canada. The sound of people screaming raises the heart rate more than just the sound of gate slamming. They know the difference between gate slamming and screaming directed at them. And some more recent work but done by Paul Hemsworth's team showed normal talking, that's not a problem. But the yelling and the screaming, we need to stop it. Just stop it. I don't know how many times I've had a rancher's wife say to me, if I get my husband to stop screaming at him. Well, not good. Never surprise an animal. You know, kind of let it know by talking to it before you touch it. Another principle is stroke it. Don't pat like this. Stroke it. Stroke it. And don't do tickle touches. Little light tickle touches. Set off an alarm response. Okay, I'm sure everybody who's working the dairy knows that cows can kick out to the side. That's something different than a, than a horse. Something that you need to know. Also, there's an optimal pressure for holding an animal. One of the big mistakes that people make with restraint, and I don't care if it's a little animal or it's a great big animal, you're holding it with a hydraulic chute, when it struggles, they just squash it tighter. Well, first of all, let's give it a non-slip floor. Let's make sure you don't throw it off balance when you're holding it. There's kind of an optimal pressure you need. It's not too tight and not too loose. Well, tame animal, you can just lead it, and you've got to make sure you don't do something really stupid, like wrap the lead rope around your hand and get dragged. Don't want to be doing that. Now, people need to understand the animal's flight zone. Now, if you have completely tamed dairy cattle, they may have no flight zone at all. They'll be better off just leading them. You've got beef cattle that seldom see people that all have big flight zone. Genetics affects flight zone. The more flighty animals tend to have a bigger flight zone than the genetically calmer ones. Animals that are in close contact with people will have a smaller flight zone. But I want to warn you, animals differentiate between a man in the alley and a man in the pen. Both cattle and pigs do this. So you can be in very close contact. Let's say you're raising some, uh, some cattle inside and you never walked in the pen with them. They may panic and get a big flight zone when you walk in the pen. See, in the alley and in the pen, that's like two different pictures. So I'm going to modify that and say animals that are raised in close contact with people that walk through the herd will get a really small flight zone. 
animals that are handled calmly, they're going to have a smaller flight zone. And as I discussed this morning, I think I could go out on a farm, you know, for a welfare audit and I could figure out which dairy herd's really fearful, which one's kind of neutral, and which one do the cows come towards you. Probably won't be able to do much more than that. But people need to understand, you know, kind of the animal's flight zone. And again, avoid the blind spot in the back. Now, if you're working up really, really close to the animal, the point of balance is going to be the shoulder. And one mistake that I want to get people to stop when they're working animals up really close is stand at the head and poke the butt. They're at the head and then they poke the butt of the stack and expect it to go forward. No, if you want it to go forward, you've got to be behind the shoulder. Now, if you get a little further away from the animal, maybe I can show you here with an arrow. Um, Boy, this arrow looks like it's having a nervous breakdown. Um, <laughs> you've, got the, you've got the eye right here. Now, if, if you're right up close, when you cross the point of balance, they'll go forward. The point of balance will be at the shoulder. You get out further away from the animal, lots of times the point of balance will move forward, and you get just past the eye, and they'll go forward. You know, it's going to vary. Point of balance is going to vary some. But I want to teach people that there is a point of balance. And the mistake that people make is, is, is they don't understand that. And it tends to be right up close to the shoulder when you're up close in the chute. If you want to reliably get them to go forward, it's going to be at the shoulder. And they'll be just past the eye when you're further away. But you've got to get, you've got to get behind the point of balance if you're trying to make them move forward. Unless you've got a whole bunch of cattle coming out of a pen then once the leaders moved forward, then the other cattle will walk out by you. When you get too close to an animal in the big flight zone, they're going to rear up. And the mistake that people make is to try to shove it back down. In this situation here, what you should do is back up. Get out of the point of balance. And if you do that, I mean, excuse me, not get out of the point of balance, get out of the flight zone. What you need to be doing is uh, get out of his flight zone. Just back up, get away from him. And usually he'll just go right back down again. He's rearing because he doesn't like you that close to him. If you're moving animals down an alleyway and they start to turn back, the mistake that people make is they get up there and they're just getting too close. Back up. Back up. Back up before they start to turn back. Don't push them quite so hard. Dogs around the chutes, I want to ban them. I do a lot of work with the packing plants, and I've almost had my head taken off. I've been nearly killed by cattle handled with dogs around the chutes, trains them to kick with both back feet. I've seen, I've seen dogs be used out in an open area, but around the chutes, I just hate them. And there's two kinds of cattle that are really dangerous to handle. Ones that have been handled by dogs in chutes, and ones where they've only been handled on horseback, and they've never been taken in and out of a pen by workers on foot. So now they've got a three-foot flight zone on a horse and a 50-foot flight zone to somebody on foot. And if you're in a 20-foot pen, that's like real dangerous because they rush out by it. There's been some accidents where people have been knocked over. You know, people need to realize they differentiate. So let's get animals accustomed to being handled on foot, handled with a four-wheeler, and make sure that the introduction of the four-wheeler is nice and you're not doing something bad with it. This is just a handy-dandy way to get animals to move forward when they're standing in a chute. So if here's the tailgate. If I just, if I just step forward and walk back by, quickly, kind of quickly, so walk back by the shoulder, they're going to go forward. And this principle also works out in a pen. You get inside the flight zone and walk in the opposite direction of desired movement, they go forward. And I've got videos up on YouTube that show this. You can type in Temple Grand and uh, Cattle, find the videos. Fill the crowd pen half full. I constantly am fighting this. People want to move these great big groups up. Now, obviously, with dairy cows, since that's a voluntary movement, you can, you know, put a big bunch in there, but even there, people lost times bring too many up. But beef cattle and our pegs, you want to move small groups. Good handling takes more walking. And people don't want to do the walking. And you fill it half full. 
and you don't have to be jamming the crowd gate up. And you want to wait until you got room in the, in the single file chute, and then you bring the cattle up and just keep them on moving. You want to use following behavior. You know, animals have natural following behavior. You want to use those natural behaviors to help you handle them. And another thing is, get the electric prods out of your hand. And they shouldn't even have an electric prod down at the crowd pen. They had it down there because it put too many cattle in there. And it gets a little flags there, but don't get aggressive with those flags. You need to learn how to just use little small movements to move the animals. And notice that your guy in the purple shirt there standing back. Because if he stood up real, real close right here, they wouldn't go in. But he's standing back. People have got to be standing in the right places. Use the following behavior. Another basic principle, cattle handling, is cattle want to go back to where they come from. They always want to return to where they came from. Pigs do the same thing, and sheep do the same thing. And on this crowd pen, you make it in a complete circle, you're taking advantage of the going back to where they come from. You want to use the principle of going back to where they came from. You know, there's several different designs that can do this. And the good ones all use the principle of you bring them in and they go back to where they came from. It's a natural behavior that they have. Another thing is livestock are herd animals and they get frightened when separated from the herd. The lone animal can be very dangerous to handle. I get called in lots of times as an expert witness on cattle handling accidents. And there's two things they involve. The lone animal or bulls attacking people. Those are the two problem areas. Now, bulls attacking people, that's not fear. And one of the worst bulls for attacking people is the hand-reared pet. Because when he gets to be sexually mature at 18 months to two years, instead of going out and fighting other cattle, he fights with, the, he knocks over the dairyman because he views the dairyman as a rival for mates. So the way to prevent a lot of dangerous stuff with bulls is to make sure they're reared on cows in a social group. Now that makes a problem at a dairy. Well, you need to get them into, into at least a group of calves just as quickly as possible. Most dangerous way to raise a bull would be to rear him on, you know, in somebody's backyard and, uh, uh, you know, then he gets to be 18 months old and he turns on you. You know, let's just make him into a steer project really, really early on, you're not going to have a problem. See, the problem that you've got with the bull, it's not a tameness issue, it's mistaken identity. And I want that bull growing up knowing that he's a bull, that he's got to be with other cattle. You know, and it's mainly a guy thing. It's usually not a heifer or a steer thing. Sheep you can move in continuous flow. They're sort of like siphoning water. They are absolute master followers. They really, really follow. Bring a mate along when you got a doctor and animal. They get upset when they are alone. So bring a friend along. And then you're a lot less likely to have a problem. Lone animal. If you work with bison, when that tails up, he's not happy. Low animal puts a lot of people in the hospital. You know, when it comes to accidents, bulls are the number one cause of fatalities with livestock. That includes horses. Now, things like falling off of horses and uh, accidents around the cattle handling facilities, that's the number one cause of injuries, not fatalities. But bulls are the number one cause of fatalities. An electric prod must never be a person's primary driving tool. Only time you need to, you, only time you should use it is move something that's very stubborn, like it won't go in the squeeze chute, absolutely won't go, and then you put it away. Get it out of your hand. You just absolutely should not be carrying them around. Now I'm not going to recommend banning them because I've seen too many abusive things with broken tails, sticks up the butt bashing animals with various, you know, taking a paddle edgewise and just smashing animals with it. No, it'd be better off to do one shot, but then you put it away. It's getting it out of your hand. That's the thing I'm going to be adamant about. And we're going to be talking about best practices, and, and uh, I want to get that prod out of people's hands, move small groups, 
and you get rid of screaming and yelling. Those are three simple things we got to do. Now, there's a lot of pe people are teaching a lot of low stress handling techniques, but before you can learn some of those more advanced techniques, you've got to do the basics. I like little flags. I actually like them better than the paddles. They're not as heavy. But don't get in there waving it. Just, no, no. Just use it to guide it. See how that animal's looking at it? Now, you'll notice there in that facility, you've got um, metal pipes there on the ground. You might want to cover those up with dirt. It's going to work better if they don't see those pipes. Sudden novelty is frightening. The thing about new experiences is they are attractive when the animal's allowed to voluntarily approach and scary when you shove it in their face. I call it the paradox of novelty. The animals with a flighty genetics are most likely to get excited when they go in a new place. But the thing is, animals that have seen a lot of new things, uh, actually says yeah, animals that have never seen many new things are more likely to become agitated at auctions. You want to get animals accustomed to seeing quite a lot of different things before you take them to town. And this is true whether it's taking them to an auction, a meat plant, the fairgrounds. I don't know how many people have said to me, my steer or my horse or my dairy heifer, whatever it was, was coming home and went berserk at the show. Well, you got a lot of new things there, flags, bikes, and balloons. The best way to acclimate, acclimate the animal to some of this new stuff would be tie them to the fence. Not the animal, the flags and the blues. <laughs> you tie the flags and the blues to the fence out in the pasture and let the animal approach it. Let the animal voluntarily approach these things. Just put a stationary bike somewhere. Let them approach and just wheel it around slowly. And bikes are scary because they move up suddenly, sudden and silent. And the animal that can be one of the animals most likely to go berserk in a new place might be an animal where a single herdsman, maybe a very good herdsman, has worked with those animals. But they've seen no other vehicles, no other people, no other uh, new things, and when they're brought to town, they just go berserk. So you want to get animals acclimated to new things before you take them into town. That will help uh, prevent a lot of problems. Well. It was mentioned earlier about using an umbrella as a sudden novel stimulus. Well, these Karamara horses are really, really uh, calm and uh, they don't get scared of much of anything. Now, if you have an animal that's got the more flighty genetics, you'll get a bigger reaction from the umbrella. And people always wonder about the stress at the meatpacking plant. And French researcher Claudia Turlow has found that animals that get a big startle reaction from a stimulus such as an umbrella back on the home farm are the animals that get the biggest reaction at the slaughter plant. So a lot of that reaction is probably novelty. First experiences with new people, places, or equipment need to be positive. You know, we need to be quietly walking animals through facilities, milking parlors, veterinary facilities. You know, sometimes we've got to do something that's not nice but it better not be the first experience with a new place, a new person, or a new piece of equipment. Now here's a horse that was afraid of a black cowboy hat. Animal fears tend to be very specific. And the horse got afraid of black hats because during a veterinary procedure, somebody threw alcohol in his eyes. This was really bad. And the horse was looking right at a black hat. White hats were fine. Now, when I put the hat down on the ground, it was less scary. But the closer the hat got to my head, the more scary it got. You see, it's a picture. They tend to associate a sound or something they were looking at. I just talked to a lady this morning. Her horse is terrified of rural-type mailboxes. And so when they do that thing in the trail class where you have to take the letter out of the mailbox, they got a real problem with that. You can have a horse that might be good with a one-piece bit, but he gets really upset with jointed snaffles because he was abused with one of those horrible um, twisted wire bits. Animal memories are sensory based. It's sensory based, it's not word based. I want you to get away from the world of words. You know, like for, and, and animals will make generalizations. And one common generalization is girls are good, guys are bad. 
or maybe men with beards are bad. There was an elephant at the zoo that was terrified of diesel-powered equipment. If it ran with a gas engine, that was fine, but if it was diesel, it was bad. And the horse will be fine with a one-piece bit, but be afraid of that jointed snap of it. You see, they're different sensory pictures. <laughs> Gotta think audio clips, video clips, feeling pictures. Like maybe take the two kinds of bits and put them in your hand and shut your eyes and think about how they feel differently. Well, I had an interesting experience out on the movie set that was actually quite dangerous. And the thing that I found was that the movie crew was worried about the wrong things. Now you'll notice right there, there's the Claire Danes, I'll point her out, she's right there. They were filming the scene, the pond, and the cattle were out there on the pasture, and they were worried that all right behind everybody was all of this equipment, and they were afraid that the cattle would stampede. You know what the cattle ended up doing? There's a scene in the movie where the calf comes up to the edge of the pond and walks in, and that scene was put in the movie, there was a kind of a gift from the cattle. They were attracted to all the novelty of the vehicles because they could come up and, 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 and keep a safe distance. It wasn't shoved in their face. Okay, and that, that uh, red animal right there, Halderbroke trained heifer, show heifer, nice animal. Well, they forgot to, about reflector boards. You know, she was trained to all the movie equipment. She was trained to things like white panel trucks, nothing, uh, reflector boards, flipping around, moving around erratic directions. So I knelt down to get this publicity picture, and they, they call it a grip, because they're guys that grip stuff. Well, his grip was gripping this reflector board, four by eight white styrofoam pan, and he pulls it. Next thing I know, the heifer's rising up to be on top of me, and I scream, don't move it. And then he moved it again, and I'm not gonna repeat the swear words that came out. <laughs> and what this shows you is, is just how specific animal memories are. You know, a white panel truck just isn't the same as a reflector board. First of all, it has a sound that it makes. It moves in a different manner. Reflector board movement's gonna be very, very erratic. Well, they forgot to train the movie heifer to reflector boards. You know, well, on a movie site, you got lots of those. I would have been training that out on the ranch, like, you know, and then they, they put them on light stands, and then sometimes they fall over. Well, they better learn that when they fall over, they're all right. Well, if you do stuff like slam the bars on the cattle's head, they're going to be harder to get in there in the future. I think sometimes people forget that, you know, when you're working with animals, you want them to grow. And if you bash them on the mouth, they're not going to grow. I tell people in the feedlot industry, well, you're running a hotel and a restaurant for cattle. How would you like if you checked into the Hyatt and the doorman uh, uh, shocks you and then the desk clerk punches you in the mouth? I don't think you're going to want to eat in their dining room after uh, that happens. Man on the horse, man on the ground. Cattle perceive that as two totally different things. We've already discussed that. The horse does the same thing. You can have horses where you can ride them just fine, but you can't do veterinary work because they had bad experiences with the horseshoe or the veterinarian. Or you can have a horse that's good for all the ground work, but you can't ride it. You see, riding and on the ground, that's like two different files in the animal's brain. Cattle that have been exclusively handled on horseback may become very agitated when you get in a small pen with them. Bulls, we already talked about that some. This was a nice, friendly bull. I got this picture off a website. It was a government website of an energy, uh, and, and crews were out taking uh, pictures while they were um, uh, putting up windmills for electric power generation. This bull's out in the pasture, and like, the workers were feeding him in lunches and everything, and he didn't go after anybody. And I think one of the reasons why he didn't was because he'd grown up with other cattle. It's good that he was a friendly bull, because he could have had some dead uh, building contractors otherwise. Would not have been good. But you rear them in a social group, then they're not interested in going after people. Then people are going to just be benevolent treat givers. Unfortunately, the way we rear uh, dairy bulls actually makes them bad. 
and it makes a lot of problems with stallions. We take that young yearling, we lock it up in a stall, and then you wonder why it's a nutcase, an aggressive nutcase. It's never learned any social give and take with other animals. Okay, never turn your back on a bull. We've already discussed the hand rear of the bull, and if they're going to go bad on you, it's usually at 18 to 24 months of age. And we have a lot of big dairies that are, start, that are using bulls now more and more. And I think we need to start looking at maybe raising them on nurse cows, because I'd like to reduce this danger problem. There's an old paper that was done by Ed Price where he managed to make killer Herefords. And Hereford cattle are usually really nice, but he raised them like dairy calves individually. And they got a lot of really dangerous uh, Hereford uh, bull calves. People often don't realize when the, before the bull charges you, he gives you the broadside threat display. He wants to show you how big and bad he is. Turn sideways, hunch himself up. People need to learn to recognize a broadside threat. And if a bull does a broadside threat on a dairy, uh, he needs to be called. And you don't take him to the auction to kill somebody else. No, right straight to the locker plant. Let's not have an accident. And if you raise them in a social group, then they're probably not going to be interested in attacking people. Also, we need to be careful with newborn, uh, you know, mothers with newborns. There's different levels in how much a mother with a newborn protects her baby. And I've done a lot of research on cattle temperament, calm animals, uh, you know, better weight gain. But if you do too much selection for calm temperament, you might lose mothering ability. And out west, we're getting more and more wolves and coyotes, and we're going to need to have a little bit of that protective ability. So when you work on the calf, let her see it. Keep the calf in between you and the calf. Then uh, she's going to be a whole lot happier. Now we need to be, you know, if we do raise the, the uh, dairy calves, if you're going to make bulls out of them, rear them in groups. Okay. We talked this morning about, you know, the, the measurements of auditing at the packing plant. Well, we can do some handling auditing out on the farm. Well, I would hope on a dairy you got none of the cattle falling down. I sincerely hope in the, in the milking parlor that your pride score is, is zero, hopefully. Let's look at maybe positive measurements in a dairy. Chewing the cud. How many cows in your parlor chew the cud? Let's make a really nice positive measure. These handling measurements on here are more for beef. I'll give you a measure that you can use for dairy calves. How many cud chewers have you got during milking? That's a sign that they're calm. You know, and if they're dancing around like this, that's not a sign that they're calm. Well, that's my last slide, and hopefully we've got some time for some questions, and I want to thank everybody for staying awake till the end. I'm going to pick somebody. Okay, right here. Sense of smell. Um, well, one uh, then the, the sense of smell. One thing you don't want to have in a slaughter plant is air blowing back in their face. If you blow air back in their face, they will not go in. That also messes up uh, things in feedlots too. Um, I have found that things like a brand new facility with the smell of fresh paint, they won't they won't go in. Now there is some research that shows that there is fear alarm substances. Now what I have found is those, let's say you put an animal in a chute and you, it does one little moo and you let it out, that's not long enough to get the fear stuff to come out. But let's say you flip an animal in a chute, stuck in there, you spend 20 minutes getting it out, there's a fear substance that'll be in the urine and in the saliva, and the other cattle are not gonna wanna walk over that. And I've, I've, I've seen it happen, you know, in a stun box. I've seen it just happen in a chute where an animal got over on its back and the other cattle absolutely refused to walk over that sliver until we washed it away. 
And that's uh, shown up in cattle and, it's in, in also shown up in pigs. But it takes a little time for that to come out. They have to get really upset from you know, several minutes before they start to get that fear stuff. Okay? Is a drop or shoot or like the tamer system, is that universally useful on all amulets? It's often used on a game farm or exotic books. Okay, I just want to, you know, uh, repeat the question. The question was about a drop floor type shoot that's used for deer. They walk in, the floor drops out. Those need to be fixed so that the deer doesn't go crashing down. Because then you're going to do a sudden movement and you get the fear of falling. That's going to make them afraid to go in there. Now, some of the real nice ones that I've seen, they've got very heavily padded sides so that you can squeeze the deer up. And then when you take the floor out, he doesn't, uh, he doesn't even slide down. But I hate the metal ones where you put them in there and it doesn't have any squeeze sides and you drop the floor and the deer goes crashing down. That's guaranteed to just totally frighten it. No, I don't like those at all. I can't hear you. Well, the point of the floor is okay when they when they just have the metal ones. You got you know V-shaped sides that are metal, and deer walks in there. And now you want to restrain the deer, so you drop the floor. Then the deer gets wedged down into the V and is restrained. Now a better way to do it. You see, you have the, you can still have it, you still need, may have it V-shaped, but you put more padding in there. The deer walks in, you can squeeze him up in the pads, and then you can take the floor away, but then he's held in the pads, and you're not just dropping it down. Another thing, if you put padding in it, then you're getting even pressure all over the body. Where just a metal thing, you're going against pressure points. No, some of those things are really bad news. Okay, I'm going to pick somebody. Okay. Okay. Well, on how do you, the question is, if you're a consumer, how do you find out, you know, where food's processed? Well, on like just you know, boxes of regular meat, this little round seal that says EST and then a number, that's the establishment number. Now if you're looking at a processed product like bologna, that might only tell you where it's processed, it won't tell you where it's slaughtered. Like on something like pork chops, you'd probably be, be able to trace back where it was slaughtered. Uh, you know, people are demanding more and more wanting to know where things come from. Well, there's different, lab there's different labels doing different things. And as I talked about this morning, you got to make sure that you're actually doing the stuff that you claim in your advertising. Because I've been involved in a lot of these um, animal welfare panels for different companies. And I worked with one company who will remain nameless. They were interested in it strictly from a public relations standpoint. Because when I started to pin them down about how we were going to, you know, document and audit, that they actually were fulfilling the label claims, then they got not interested. And they did not have a good enough auditing program to satisfy me that they could, I could be sure that producers were doing the things they're supposed to be doing. I mean, if you say you're cage free, then you gotta be cage free. You, you know, you've got whatever your label is, you gotta do the stuff you say you're doing. Well, that's one of the reasons. That's the reason why I talk about the three legs on the tripod, because this is not just an issue for the meat industry. You know, that peanut factory. You know, they got like a good score on a third-party audit, and there was pigeon crap all over the place. Now, another problem, and I talked about people getting in and watering down standards. I've been in ridiculous meetings where people have talked about boundaries of audit, like for example. The auditor goes to an egg facility. He may, the, the, the audit, the tool that he's given just covers the egg handling equipment outside of the hen house and doesn't cover inside the hen house. So he goes just in that little small area 
and that's okay. The hen house may be a rat hole. That actually happened. And, and I've, I've been in really bad meetings where people talk about, well, once you, uh, you know, let's say you're driving in before the audit starts and you saw bad stuff. They'll say, well, that's outside the boundaries of the audit. And I'm going, uh-uh, man. How am I going to explain that to people, uh, you know, out in public? How am I going to stand up at a Barnes & Noble bookstore in New York and uh, defend some of that kind of nonsense? When I'm driving in and I see something really bad, it should count. Okay, right there. Measurements for dairies, yes. Yeah, on Grandin.com, yeah, I do have numbers for dairies. And Jennifer showed some of those numbers, and, um, and I, she showed that awful picture of the calf in the alleyway. Well, I got calf cleanliness, uh, you know, clean, dry place for the calf. That's not a clean, dry place for the calf. And colostrum. You know, those are, you know, you can't neglect the calves. Okay, right here. Well, future and I'm no longer here. Fortunately, there's more people uh, getting interested in these things. When I started out, I was a lone pioneer. Fortunately, there are a lot of people coming up, uh, uh, coming into this. Uh, I was at the welfare judging yesterday. There were teams from universities in both the U.S. and Canada there. These were all um, uh, veterinary students uh, and graduate students. They were interested in animal welfare. You know, 10 years ago, the idea of a welfare judging team would have been looked at as crazy. You know, things, things are changing. There's somebody right over there. Castrating, methods for castrating and dehorning calves. The research is quite clear that we should be giving them uh, lidocaine, and analgesics afterwards to control pain. And the research also shows do it really young. If you want to look up some of that research, you can get the abstracts free off the PubMed database. Just go to Google, type in P-U-B-M-E-D. Of course, everybody at the university knows how to do this. But if you're outside the university, you can still do this for free. Get the summaries for the journal articles free. Go to PubMed, type in calves and castration, calf dehorning. Uh, now in dairy, it's a lot easier to do than it is in beef. Because in dairy, uh, you can put the lidocaine in and then come back and uh, you know, do the dehorning and the castration after it's taken effect. Now in beef, you've got the problem of handling the calf twice. So you might increase stress there unless you use a method where you can do the whole thing all at the same time. But there's a lot of studies on this now, and it's well documented about using anesthetics and analgesics for pain relief. Okay, right there. The question concerns positive indicators. Well, so far in the auditing systems, unfortunately, there's been more emphasis on negative things because I got to get bad stuff just cleaned up. You know, like if I got too many lame cows, I got too many skinny cows, somebody needs to just fail an audit. Or too many filthy ones, or too many with hock leashes. I think cud chewing is one of the things that can be looked at. Uh, how are the cows willing to come up to people? That's a simple thing that can be looked at. Now the European Quality Audit has been trying to, you know, do more positive indicators Unfortunately, uh, it's too complicated. Uh, they've got things like a, a cow that's distressed or a cow that's uh, agitated. I don't know how to differentiate between those two. Uh, but this is something, figuring out more simple indicators that we can do in the field. Well, cows chewing their cud in the milking part. That's one. I saw an interesting thing. Go to a plant where they use leader sheep to handle all the sheep at the slaughter plant. It's a great big huge slaughter plant. They have a 
have a leader specialist that takes the lambs out of the trucks, another leader that takes them out of the pens, and another leader who goes up the chute and comes out the secret door. And when those leaders shape are just together relaxing, they're all chewing their cuts. So there's like six leaders in a pen chewing their cuts. And the rest of the sheep there were not chewing our cuts. But the leaders were really relaxed. Um, and in a lot of handling things where you're doing veterinary work, even if we do it absolutely perfectly, I don't think they're going to chew their cuts during it. But when people walk through the barn, we may we need to be doing research studies to look at uh, different dairies, how much cud chewing there is in the milking part or, or just uh, when the herdsman walks through the barn, when strange people walk through the barn, because that's an easy behavior for me to teach people to, to look at. I can't, um, I, I can't, on the European quality, they're putting too many things in there. They have like 10 or 12 different things they're trying to measure. We've got to get, we've got to figure out simpler things to look at. But then we also have to make sure on the negative stuff, because the reason why so many of my audits have negative stuff on it is you're talking about things that are used as criteria for kicking a slaughter plant or a farm off an approved supplier list. I don't think I can kick them off the approved supplier list on cud chewing. But too many lame cows, that would be something somebody ought to get delisted for. Because I've got, I've got to make sure that they aren't doing the bad stuff, and then I can worry about the good stuff. But there are certain bad things that they just absolutely shouldn't be doing. Well, dogs and cats are predators. Yeah, dogs and cats are predators. I mean, translate auditing things. Well, you have, like, let's say, on dog and cat welfare, obviously somebody needs to be, you know, not starving a dog or beating it up. But there's a lot of dogs that are very miserable because they're home alone all day, and they've licked their paw or uh, they've uh, injured their paw on licking it. Um, you know, they're, or they're just tied up somewhere or they're locked in a basement. That's not very good life for dog, that's for sure. You know, we've bred dogs to be this hyper-social animal that's really tuned in to, to our emotions. And there's been some very interesting research on this, and the dog is quite different than the wolf. And there's a scientist uh, that did work on this, and what he did is he took, he had people bring their pet dogs into the lab, and then they also had some people bring in some tame wolves. And they just had the, uh, the dog or the wolf like sit there, and then the owner or the trainer stand here. And then there were, there's a dish here and a dish here. And the experimenter comes out, and the animal's watching, the owner's there, and the food is placed in one of the dishes. And with the dog, domestic dog, if the owner points to the other dish, dog will tend to go to it. Although, in other words, the social cue from the owner often overrides where the food is. The wolf will always go right for where the food is. Now, if we've bred dogs to be really, really, really super social, so they're not going to handle well things like being home alone all day by themselves. And that's why a lot of houses get chewed up. And it's not good welfare for the dog, and it's, it's a real bad situation. Of international levels, the countries that kind of well, England, but the countries, uh, I well, let's just look at the slaughter plants. Even back in the 70s, when things were really bad, I would, went to slaughter plants in the 70s and the 80s, and guess who had the best ones? Sweden, Denmark, those Scandinavian countries. They absolutely had the best. England had the most welfare research, their slaughter plants were a mess. The Scandinavian ones were the best. And, and uh, you know, Europe is ahead of the U.S. on welfare things, but they got a lot of regulations and stuff. It isn't necessarily transmitting to the ground. I have to say I'm very proud of what I've done with the slaughter plants. Uh, because when I started working on that, it's now 11, almost 12 years ago, when we started that program, 
all of a sudden, our plants got a whole bunch better than most of them in Europe. Well, because you had a big customer holding them their feet to the fire to certain numbers, just like traffic limits. You get more than three cattle mooing in the stunning chute, you fail on it. That's a number. Can't have more than 1% fall down. I was at an international humane slaughter meeting this summer, and I saw some European figures. Some of them are not pretty. High prod scores, falling scores, mooing scores. Because they hadn't started putting the numbers to it yet. And, they, and there's, there's a lot of reluctance to put the numbers to it. And then where do you put those numbers? You put those numbers where the top 25% of farms will pass. You don't put them where the worst places will pass. You put them where the top 25% will pass. And then you give people time to work up. I think I'm getting a signal here. <laughs> now we're going to have to stop. To okay. And I uh, want well, to thank everybody for coming.